I was um, born in North Georgia, and I grew up just outside of Athens, Georgia. That makes me a lifelong and devout Georgia Bulldog fan. And I don't talk about this a lot from the, the pulpit. I don't, I, don't, I don't rub this in. I don't, I don't just talk about I don't. I don't talk about this as much as I'd like. Um, I don't rub this in. But I'm devout. And what I mean by that is um, for years, as long as I could remember, I have cheered for the Georgia Bulldogs. I have watched their games in the good years, in the bad years. I know what you're thinking. There aren't many bad years. You're, you're right, but when we would say go 10 and 2, or 11 and 1, or heaven forbid, 9 and 3, um, I still pulled for the Georgia Bulldogs. The good, the bad, the ugly. I bleed red, uh, just like you do. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I will not wear certain colors, shades of orange. I won't wear certain shades of crimson. There's a state that is west of Georgia. It starts with an A, and if that's said in my house, my boys spit. I am a devout Georgia Bulldog fan. Tomorrow night, we play for our second uh, national championship in a row if we, we win. We're playing for consecutive national championships. It doesn't happen often. The last time a team did it, this team starts with the A, uh, it was in 2010. So the last teams to have tried it, one team that starts with an A and the other one, the other side of Athens, the east side over there, um, they've lost. And, man, there's a chance that we lose. And as a devout fan, I'm going to do our tradition in our household tomorrow evening. We're going to put out our Georgia flag um, our tradition this year has been ordering, I know this is going to blow your mind, but pizza from Pizza Hut, <laughs> and we're going to cheer on the dogs wearing our dog attire. And this is what I want you to know, that tomorrow night, if we win a national championship, it will change absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And if we lose tomorrow night, I don't think will happen, but very well could happen. It will change absolutely nothing. Guess what? On Tuesday morning, the sun is still going to come up. And on Tuesday night, it will still set. Though God is still good, no matter if we win or lose, my fandom will not change no matter if we win or lose. I mean, the truth is, in our lives, we are devoted to things that we pour our time, our energy, our affection into things, and those things, at the end of our lives, will not add up to a hill of beans. They will not matter. And so what I'm, I'm telling you today is that we all are called to devotion. I, 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 we read Acts 2.42. They were devoted to the apostles teaching in one another. We're called to devotion that is something much bigger than worldly things. Here's the big truth that I want us to walk away with today. Here's the big truth. There is no greater thing to be devoted to than Jesus and his church. There's no greater thing. Jesus deserves every bit of our devotion. Um, and in his church, he says to, he gives us the command to be devoted to his church. And so that's what we do. There's no greater thing to be devoted to than Jesus in, and his church. We're going to be continuing in the book of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 2 uh, still. We're we've, we, slowly working through this. I think this will take um, a year. And it will take a year only because we do some different, I do some video devotions and those kind of things to help uh, cover some of our passages of scripture and so we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 uh, starting in verse 22 this morning and when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses they brought him up to Jerusalem to present to him the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord 
Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves are two young pigeons. So I want to stop there and show you my first big idea as we start breaking apart this text, expositing God's word this morning, taking it apart and looking at it. Here's the first big idea. When you're devoted to Jesus... You are obedient to his commands, no matter your financial situation. Now, from reading that passage, you may, you may go, Zach, how did, you, how did you come up with that? Especially that last part. How, where, did, where, did the, where did someone's financial situation, where, someone's uh, uh, social status, or whether they have money or not have money, where did that come from in that passage? I... Um, I had a plane ride home uh, late Thursday night, and I don't, I don't remember what time we boarded. I think it was like close to 9 o'clock boarding the thing, right? And so it was a late night flight home. And normally I try to read or work on flights, but I thought this late at night, I'm going to binge a show. And I downloaded a show on my iPad, and I began binging it. And as I was binging this show, I, you know, I, in, in our family, Jennifer and I are just suckers for Cops, detectives, lawyers, that, that kind of thing. I guess it was a, uh, just a childhood of watching Andy Griffith and you know, all, that, all that stuff. You know, it's just led to where it is today. And, and this certain lawyer that I was watching, um, he's no Matlock. But he said, this, he said this line. He's like trying to figure out this case. He's trying to look at it. And, he's, and he says to his assistant, he says, sometimes... You have to go and you have to read, you have to look at your evidence, and you have to look at it over and over, a hundred times over, before you see it. But when you see it, you know it's there, and you know you got it. And I feel like that's what I did with this text this week. I felt like I read, read this text over and over and over, and then it was like, there it is. When it came time for their purification, according to the law of Moses, right, their, their devotion is, is showing, sh being shown in their obedience. This is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to take Jesus just like everybody else, because it's written in the law of the Lord in, in, um, in Leviticus. I had to go through it in my head. I was about to say Lamentations. Like, Lamentations, isn't it? Uh, in Leviticus, it's written in Leviticus, this is what you should do. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy. You take your male child... And you, you go um, into Jerusalem, and you go to the temple, you present them to the Lord, and you offer a sacrifice. This is what an obedient follower uh, of God, this is what a good Jewish person would do. They would go and they would offer a sacrifice. But listen what it says. A pair of turtle doves are two young pigeons. And that's the clue. I went to Leviticus 12, and I began to read. A year-old lamb is actually what was required as the offering. Not to turtle doves, unless you were poor. And if you were poor, when you went in this act of obedience, God made a way for you to still give. So what you should have given was a a year old lamb and a pigeon or a turtle dove you could make that as your this this sacrifice this would be your your offering but if you were poor you could you could you could skip the lamb and you could just throw in two pigeons or two doves which would be financially way less and this is what we know to be true of Jesus Jesus's parents Joseph and Mary that they were young that that they were just together. They were betrothed and, and then engaged and then would be married and that they would be young and that they would be poor. As I read this, I, I began to think, you know, there, there's a decent chance that if Jesus' parents walked into the average church in America, they would be looked down on because they're poor. Because in our country, in, in our materialistic world, we so often look down on or have prejudice to those who do not have. In our country, we very much are a country of the have and the have-nots. 
And man, this is what we see. In, in, in God's house, there is no have and have nots. You either have him or you don't have him. And your, your financial situation, the amount of money you have, does not change that. And then we see this ethic through, throughout Scripture, don't we? And in our country, we think money, 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 money. We think prosperity. We think gain, 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 gain. We think security comes from it. But, but yet, here we see that it doesn't. I'm, I'm just going to follow even Luke's train of thought in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6 in the Beatitudes. And of course, the Beatitudes are also in the other synoptic gospels, um, most famously in Matthew, but, but they're used here. In, in Luke 6.20, Jesus says this. He lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Here, he, he, sh- he says, blessed are the poor. We, we know what's later said when we talk about the rich young ruler and what Jesus said. It's harder for the rich man. Uh, it's easier for him to enter through the eye, a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. If you skip down to verse 24, he says, But, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. You, this is what you've got, what you've earned on earth and what you have failed uh, to give to me, what you failed to render over to me. You've got what you have here on earth. You've denied me. You've rejected me. But look at the, the poor person who knows they needed me. Continue on. Go to Luke chapter 12, verse 32. He says this, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so we're reminded the things that we, we hold on to, the treasure that we, we hold, hold on to, that's going to show where your heart is. And if you're devoted to Christ... Guess what? Your bank account is going to tell it. And this is what was true. Think about this this young couple in Mary and Joseph who did not have two pennies to rub together. They went and did what they were called to do. Their their devotion led them to uh, to, to be obedient to the commands of Christ. This is what the law said to do. This is what they did. It's, it's It's a beautiful... It's a beautiful, obedience is a beautiful thing. It makes me think there of the widow's might, Luke 21. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts in the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. And so, I look at this beginning passage, the the very first steps after Jesus is born. They wait eight days. It says in the prior verses, Jesus is circumcised. And then, according to the law, they did what the law prescribed, what the Lord commanded. They waited the time period, and they made the the five-mile travel from Bethlehem to Jerusalem to sacrifice, to offer Jesus. Just, just as we see in the Old Testament, this offering of the Son. To go, hey, we're offering our Son, Lord. He is yours. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And the devoted Christian will live their life this way. Not devoted to the things of the world, but devoted to Christ. And your actions then will follow it. In the Old Testament, we often talk about uh, the, the tithe. Uh, we, we would say that in the Old Testament that, that we uh, would give a tenth of what you had. So if you had ten bulls, you give one bull. Well, that's a very, it's true, that's true. Uh, but it's a simplified way of looking at it because there's multiple offerings throughout the year. There's, there's Thanksgiving offerings, there's sin offerings, um, there's offerings at certain festivals and this festival. So in, in reality, it was more. In the New Testament, we kind of look at that and go, okay, this is the principle 
that we would then give a tenth of what we earn to, to, to say, hey, this is to Christ. This is who I'm devoted to first. That this is a first fruit offering. That this comes first. And it's beautiful what the Lord does. That the Lord says, hey, it doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. Your offering is your offering, and it's beautiful. I mean, he looks at the, the, this widow's might who gave out of her poverty. I'm often blown away in our church by our college students because this is what I know. Um, some of our college students, they poor. <laughs> you know, they, they, are, they are walking, living poverty in our midst. Like, I, I remember one pastor telling, a, he, he pastored a church with a lot of college students, and they, passed the, they still passed the plates, and he said one Sunday, they got a bacon, egg, and cheese McGriddle. And I was, you know, he was like that. It was a college student, no doubt. You knew exactly who did it. It was a college student that, it, it, I'm blown away that our college students, so many of them, are just faithful to give. Some of our college students outgive some of our families. They're, they're, they're devoted. They're going, you know, I don't, I don't have much. But I'm going to give away first. I'm going to trust the Lord in, in this ob obedient action. I, I could just think that there would be a lot of couples that would be in Mary and Joseph's position that go, look, we don't have anything. We don't have nothing. Let's not even waste the trip and insult the Lord. But the beauty of, the beauty of this is we don't, we don't bring anything to the table, but it's all gifts from God. And no matter what he's gifted us, we turn around and we gift it back. It's, it's, it's the beauty of devotion and following Christ. So no matter your financial situation, we all have the ability to, when we give, it takes the treasure. It, it makes us, it recalibrates our hearts to say, hey, this isn't just about giving. This is about our devotion to Christ. Now, let's keep going. Verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came in the spirit into the temple. And so I, I read this passage. We, we read of, of Simeon. Simeon who would have been there. Um, someone who worshipped faithfully at the temple. Who showed up at the temple. Who was looking for the Messiah. Who was looking for the advent of Christ. He was, he was looking for the Savior to come. That's what Simeon was doing. Simeon had read the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament. He knew that it, what it prophesied, that a Messiah would come, that a Savior would come. And so he waited expectantly. He visited the temple. He worshiped. And somewhere in there, the Holy Spirit revealed to him, hey, you will not taste death until you get to meet the Messiah. Now, I want you to understand something. That's a gift. There would have been many, 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 thousands and thousands of others of Jewish people who longed to see the Messiah, who longed for the Messiah to come that would not get that opportunity. But in the Lord's sovereign hand, with his sovereign plan, he blessed Simeon and he told Simeon, hey, it's coming. And so it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, and he's sitting there, it says, And the Holy Spirit nudges him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And says, get up and go to the temple. And so here's my next big idea, is that when you are devoted to Jesus, you walk in his spirit. At, at, at our church, we often say, if not in the power of the Holy Spirit, then the power of who? If not in the power of the Holy Spirit, then in the power of who? Well, the answer to that is yourself, and you're, you're living in your own flesh. You're living in your, your own power. You're not dependent on what the Spirit would do, the way that the Spirit works. And so some of you, as I say this, you're like, I have no clue what you're talking about. I've never really felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit to do something. 
But yet, this is what we know, that the Spirit moves and works, that the Spirit draws people unto himself, that but what, when we were in rebellion to God, when we had hatreds in our heart towards God, that, that, that movement of our heart towards God was the Spirit working in us. And what we know is that those who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised their son from the dead, God saves. And when he saves you, he puts your holy, his Holy Spirit in you. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I once lived in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God. That means you are walking in the Spirit. I, I, can, I could walk through hundreds of times in my life where I, I just felt, this is the right thing to do. This is, this is, a, this is what we ought to do. This is... This is what the Lord is calling me to do, and I ought to do it. I mean, there's been some times where I wasn't looking for that, sometimes where it was, it was a, a, a random act. It's a, it's a, hey, the Lord puts somebody in your path. You ought to go over there and talk to them and share Jesus with them. And then you do, and, and, and the Lord moves and works. There's other times where the Lord puts it in your path, but there's other times where you have to wait and you have to beg for it. I, I'll be honest. I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting in a time where I'm begging God to speak. Look. If you look around, this room is packed. Um, we've added chairs in here. It's, it's packed. Um, the next service has, has been full. I'm, I'm asking the Lord, do we go to three services? Do we, do we, do we plant another, another campus? Do you provide a planter? What, what, what do we do? What Do we start another church? Do, I, what, what do we do? I'm begging. I'm asking the Lord, what is it that you do? This is what I know. I must walk in his spirit. We must, as a people, walk in his spirit, we must trust him and follow him. And this is what Simeon did. And there's, there's proof that when the spirit called upon him, he got up and he moved. Let's continue reading the second part of verse 27. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said... Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother, Mary and Joseph, marveled at what he had said about them. Here's the next big idea I want to show you is that Christian devotion is how we should respond to Jesus' work on the cross. Christian devotion is how we should respond to Jesus' work on the cross. It's not the other way around. We're not devoted to Jesus, therefore he saves us. He saved us, therefore we're devoted to him. And there's a big difference. One is a works-based salvation that means out of my devotion... Out of, out of my obedience, out of my following, out of my fandom, I've earned this favor. But that's not the gospel at all. And that's not what Simeon is speaking out in his song. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. Lord, you're doing this according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. That being this little baby Jesus that his parents walked in there with. They walked in, and, and he knew, he looked and said, this is the Messiah that you've promised. This is salvation come that, that you've prepared in the presence of all people, that you're raising up a light of revelation to the Gentiles. That means that this is going to reveal, God was going to reveal himself to the Gentiles, that they may see Jesus, believe in Jesus, repent, and turn to him and be saved, and the glory of the Israelites, the glory of the Jewish people would be Jesus. And so Christian devotion is how we should respond. We should respond blessing the Lord. We should respond praising the Lord. That should, uh, praise should be the Christian's response. How we respond in devotion uh, is directly related to what we believe about salvation. And so Christ came and he saved. Therefore, out of that, what God works in our hearts is working out. Out of his salvation comes our devotion. Verse 33, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. They marveled this, and they knew. 
mean, this is Mary and Joseph who angels visited them to tell them of the coming of their kid. They knew, but yet when they still heard yet again the glory about their child being salvation, they again stepped back and marveled it. I have to think that in the years to come, we're gonna, there's a whole lot of Jesus' life that's going to happen in just a few verses in, in this week and next week. I have to think that there are many times that Mary and Joseph sat back and they marveled at Jesus. And man, we, in our devotion to Christ for what he's done, in our worship of Jesus for what he's done, we must sit back and marvel at what was said. Verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This is heavy. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and, a, and for a son that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thought, thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Here's the next thing that I want to show you is that when you are devoted to Jesus, you're willing to suffer. This was, this, was, this was a prophetic word um, that would say, hey, this Jesus whom you're holding, this baby, he came to save many. Many are going to fall. Many are going to rise uh, in, in Israel. It's, it's, it's saying, hey, the, the, the other governments, the false uh, leaders of the world, uh, they're going to fall. They're not salvation. Uh, salvation doesn't come through them. It comes through Jesus. He's going to be raised up. But he's going to be raised up, and, and he's prophesying, essentially, he's going to be crucified. His, his fall, his, his death is going to be what raises others up. And, and this is thrown into her. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So this young mother, carrying the Messiah, carrying this uh, anointed special Baby, that is, God, literally, God in the flesh is told that her baby is going to die for the sake of others. So she knows that she is going to suffer for others. I don't know that there are many moms who bring home their newborn child that want to look that child Wrapped there, holding that baby, and think, babe, I'm going to raise you to die. I'm going to raise you to die that others might live. No, that's not the thought that we have, is it? It's that I'm going to raise you to live. I'll do everything I can to keep you safe. I'll do everything I can to protect you. And yet she's told, and, and I would just remind you, the night of the crucifixion, Mary's there. She's there. This is looking forward to what is going to happen. She it is if a, the sword that pierced Jesus' side, as she looks on it, it is if she, it would have pierced her. In 2022, as my brother was in the hospital all those days, as he was withering away, I watched my mom sit by his side and hold his hand over and over and over. She would say, if I could take this from you, I would. If I could take you from this, I would, because I love you. I don't want to watch you die. And Man, when my brother died, I was holding one hand, his wife was holding one, and my mom was rubbing his head. No mother... No mother wants to watch her baby die, but I guarantee you this, that every mother in the room would suffer that her children might not. That's what love is, right? And here's the beauty of the gospel, and this is what we see that's going to build in Scripture, is that Christ would suffer for us because he loved us. Christ would suffer as a mom would suffer so that her child would not. Christ was the only one who could suffer. Christ was the only one who could pay the price for our sins. The mother's love could not take that away. Your mother's love cannot pay the price for your sins. Because just like Mary. By the way, Mary was a sinner. She, she was just, what was she just doing? But paying a sin offering. Because our mothers aren't perfect. Because our mothers 
are sinners. They can't pay the price for our sins. Only Jesus could. And here's the beauty of this. As devoted followers, this is what we have to learn. Mary obviously was willing to live and to suffer so that others might live. And we ought to be the same way. Devoted followers of, of Jesus must be willing to suffer. If we look farther down in, in Luke, we're going to see that. We're going to see over and over in Luke that we're called to suffer. That we're called to follow Christ no matter what. Let's continue. Verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him, to him all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So here's my next big idea, is that when you are devoted to Jesus, you're willing to wait on God to move. She was advanced in years, might be the biggest understatement in this passage. This lady was old. She lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. So, um, man, let's say if she was Mary's age and was 13 when she got married, that means she'd be at, at 20, right? And then as a widow until she was 84. So think about that. From, let, let's say so there's different interpretations of how old she was. Some people think that she was a widow 84 years. Other people think that she was 84 years at this, this point. So if some people are right, and, and, they, and, and she lived without her husband 84 years, you've got to think she's like 104. If not, uh, she, she's 84, and she's been without a husband 64 years. E either way, look, look at her, her waiting on the Savior to come is impressive, isn't it? So, Anna, the prophetess, who would have hung around the temple, who would have been at the temple daily, she was a devoted person. She wasn't just devoted a little bit. It's a lifelong devotion, a lifelong following uh, of, of God, a lifelong pursuit of waiting on the Messiah. She did not depart from the temple. She, some, some scholars think she may even live just outside of the temple's walls, worshiping, fasting, and, and, and prayer night and day. This is a devoted lady. She was devoted. For, for years and years and years, she was devoted. And at that very hour, she began to think, get thank, give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Listen, in our world, we live in an a world of instant gratification. Most of us at this point think Amazon Prime is too slow. We think our emails deserve immediate responses, that our text messages deserve immediate responses. Like we, we, we want, we get. We want it, we go get it. We go to the store, we get it. We are very bad at waiting. And sometimes we're going to have things put in our life that are way, way bigger than man's hands, way bigger than our ability to order it on Amazon. And what we're going to need is the power of a living God to move. We're going to see things that are so far beyond our ability, no matter how much money we have. And then when we get there, we're going to be bad at waiting. We're going to beg God. Man, the, the health, wealth, prosperity movement shows that if you just have faith, God will answer your prayer. And he'll do it, he'll do it immediately, do it this fashion. But yet what we see in the Bible is that the righteous wait, the devout wait, that there will be things in your life that you have to wait for. And that waiting is an opportunity for us to trust the Lord Waiting is an opportunity for us to depend on the Lord, to cry out to the Lord. What waiting is a, a gift. 
And so if you're devoted to Jesus, you're going to be like Anna, and you're going to be willing to show up. I'll, I'll occasionally meet somebody who comes to church, and, and I'll start a conversation, and I'll realize they need a quick fix. They need a 90-day wonder. They, they're at the, the, they feel like they're on the brink of life, and they need a turnaround. And so in my mind, I'm like, you showed up to the right place, right? Nothing will turn your life around like Jesus will turn your life around. And they'll come to church about three weeks, and when it hasn't automatically worked, they're done with church. Now, that's foolish, isn't it? That's as foolish, like this time of year, there are tons of people who are going to the gym, and they're, they're, they're working out, they're feeling it, they're feeling sore, they're going back to the gym, they're flexing the mirror, they're not seeing any change, and in three weeks, what are they going to do? They're going to walk away. But what do we know about physical exercise? That it's, it's a lifetime pursuit that when you go to the gym and you see somebody that looks jacked and stacked, that didn't happen in three weeks, right? There's no 90-day wonder, there's no wrap, there's no oil, there's no rub, there's no supplement that will make you healthy. The, the, the same thing is true spiritually. That is a life of devotion, a life of showing up and being devoted, committed. We should look at the early church in Acts 2.42 and say that's, that's the model for us, that we're devoted to the apostles' teaching. We're devoted to the breaking of bread. We're devoted to taking care of one another, devoted to living life together and realizing this is a lifetime of obedience and walking in one direction. That's what following Christ is. And so we must be willing to wait on God to move. So often in church we fabricate the movement of God. We, we, we make things happen and say that it was God happening when really we just made them happen. Rather, we ought to be like Anna and we ought to pray night and day and wait for God to move. Verse 39, we'll keep moving. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Here's my next big idea. My last big idea is that when you are devoted to Jesus, you are willing to do everyday normal things for God's glory. When you're devoted to Jesus, this, this, this little passage, man, this gives us a lot of what happens to, to Jesus' life from here to the next time we hear about him. These next verses, he's 12. Right? So from, from the time he's less than two months to the time that he's 12 years old, this is what we know. They performed everything because they were devoted followers of God according to the law of the Lord. They did everything they were told to do. They were, they were obedient. They, they, we, what we know of their story is that they went to Bethlehem, that they kept, they kept quiet as they were to keep quiet, that they named the baby Jesus as they were told to name him Jesus. He wasn't named Joseph like would have been customary. They, they, they named him Jesus, that they went to the temple, and they made this, it's about a 90-mile journey back to Nazareth. They made that 90-mile that journey, and then the child grew and became strong and filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And these same devoted mother and father, devoted to, to obeying God, devoted to, to their son, Jesus, did what normal, everyday parents do. They changed swaddling clothes. They potty trained. I don't know what it was like to potty train Jesus. I'm going to assume it was easy, right? I don't know if he cried a lot. I don't know if he ever had colic. We don't, we don't know any of those things, right? But we have to know that they are normal, everyday parents doing this normal, everyday life for the glory of God. I mean, that's a, that's a huge part of the Christian life. That's a huge part of our devotion. It's just living quiet, simple lives most days, day in and day out, devoted to what God would have us do. I, 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 look, I look forward to, to Luke chapter 9. Maybe one of my favorite passages in Luke. If, when you, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There's a dailiness to following Jesus. 
There's a, a dailiness to our walk with Christ. And man, there are so many days that it is going to feel mundane. It's going to feel unimportant. I mean, he says to them, if anyone would come, you know, if anyone would come after me, he must be willing to lose his life. But it wasn't every day of the apostles, the, the, the apostles, the disciples' life that their lives were threatened, was it? There were some days they just went fishing and cooked on a shore and, and heard stories from Jesus, right? There, there are days in the advancement of, of Paul and the church where, where, where Paul had a pretty mundane day. And we must be willing to do the very normal, mundane things. And so, man, if, if I, could, I could show you what devotion looks like in a passage of Scripture, I probably would not have picked this one. But isn't it beautiful that we look and we see that Mary and Joseph being willing to give, even though they were poor, brings God glory. It shows their devotion. That Simeon, living in the Spirit, doing, being nudged by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, Shows his devotion that in his, his worship, in his song that he wrote, in his praise, in his taking his, his mind's attention and his heart's affection and putting on the Lord for who he is and what he's done. It shows his devotion for, for Anna showing up and waiting over and over, day after day, night after night, praying and fasting and waiting on the Messiah. That in her waiting, it brought God glory, and that in Mary and Joseph, normal, everyday rearing of their child and loving their child, it brought God glory. At our church, our mission statement is very simple. We want to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. That's our mission statement as a church, and that should be your mission statement to live by. Be devoted to Christ and live your life to bring him glory. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. It is a gift and we thank you for your church. Thank you for these people in this room and how much they mean to me, how much I love them, how much I care for them. Now, Lord, I, I thank you that we're able to gather together and to pursue you, to pursue bringing you glory and honor to make your name famous in the everyday things of life. Lord, I look at our little, our little church. I look at our $17,000 that we raise for missions. I realize that in, in a lot of ways, that's a widow's might. I know there are churches that raise 10 times that for missions. But yet, in our smallness and in those moments, and in, in a bunch of college students and our, our young adults, our adults, Lord, that, that we're willing to give sacrificially, that we're willing to follow you, to be devoted to you. And so, Lord, increase our devotion to you. Lord, let our faith and trust be in you and not our own works. May our devotion come from what you have done for us. Lord, may we uh, believe in our hearts that you raised your son from the dead and live by it. Lord, may we as a church bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing a song of response.